Old and On Air is sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Able and On Air is sponsored in part by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together. Welcome to, the, uh, welcome to this edition of Able and On Air, the one and only program that for the, uh, for the past six years has been focusing on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled in Vermont and beyond. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, I'm Lauren Seiler, Arlene is off today, and with us to discuss uh, mental health and mental health beds and crisis beds and uh, crisis in intervention is Zach Hughes of Washington County Mental Health. Thank you for joining me uh, on this edition thank of you. Um, Abled and On Air again for the second time. Thank you. Can you explain um, the missions and goals of Washington County Mental Health for those that don't know? Well, I can uh, I can explain it. Uh, did that last year, but I'll explain it again. Uh, it uh, they are uh, really about um, yeah working with folks and making sure that they can uh, they can uh, be out you know be a very productive part of their community to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. uh, um, along with other organizations such as. NAMI Vermont and Washington County Mental Health. Uh, we're here today to talk about um, what a crisis is and crisis intervention. What exactly is a crisis and how does Washington County Mental Health really help well, um, uh, with that uh, situation? I think that uh, what I'd like to say about uh, crisis is that they're not, um, they're, there's no real, um, I think everyone's crisis is a little different. Mm -hmm. Um, my crisis could be different than uh, maybe yours. Or um, can, you, can you give me an example of a crisis? Well, I think a crisis for somebody is to, that they're not able to do what they want to do with their life, that they're stuck in a spot. They can't get out of that spot, or they're not able to do that at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when people don't enjoy life, uh, that becomes a, you know, for them that could be considered um, a crisis. But it's, I think, a crisis for somebody's just being outside, you know, well outside of where they would uh, be. Out of their comfort zone. That's that's right, uh, and I want to caution because people go outside their comfort zones in positive reasonings, but there are things where, if people are not enjoying their life anymore, um, that's a concern. Um, you know, and if people aren't able to, you know, uh, function uh, adequately, and I'm not talking about just because I've heard people that, well, the community expects me to do this, but it's more of do I enjoy my life? Um, is what I'm doing, uh, sleeping all day, a good thing? Um, well, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, and well, I'm tired, one day right, I'll sleep, right, you know. right. But I, you know, and I think, but a crisis can be brought on by a number of things. Just want to give some uh, some examples in my my uh, life. Um, it could be brought on by really, really bad news or unexpected news, um, such as um, you know. Um, changes in my life. Relationships are a great example. I see that a lot. People who lose friends, they, that can trigger something. Um, we're just starting to really look at trauma. Mm -hmm. And if you've kind of talked about that with other folks, but trauma is starting to be recognized now, whereas it wasn't really. How, how so? How exactly? It, um, well, it's being looked at a lot closer. Um, you know, I know, you know, Washington County Mental Health uh, looks at it very closely. Um, all staff there are required when they join to, um, to take a course that we have, uh, training mm -hmm. that's three hours long. Um, it's a one-time training that we have to take. Um, I just, uh, we were discussing it a lot more. I, for myself, am recognizing that there is stuff in my life that could be considered trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, you're getting bad news, and you're still kind of going over it a year later. That's 
not a um, that's not a one time thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's an important thing. Um, okay, crisis intervention and um, crisis beds. When yes. We deal with, um, I remember when Crocker was on the yes. show last year. Um, can you explain the different things now or the better things that Washington County is dealing with the crisis beds? Like, is, it, is there enough? crisis beds is there not enough because I know I would yeah go ahead love to uh, elaborate on this issue because um, the crisis beds are um, you know, you come in different variety of uh, services um, and what I want to say about the crisis beds right now there are alternatives right now to hospitalization and the emergency room particularly the news around, you know, people being stuck in the emergency room. What for, do you mean by being stuck in the emergency room? I'm sorry, room? I should clarify. No, um, no, that's fine, go ahead. Some, some folks, um, so say I go into the emergency room for a mental health issue and there's not a bed to serve me upstairs. I could be stuck in the emergency room for days or weeks. Exa I'd, example, um, uh, New York, has um, Bellevue Hospital. I know, I know. For years, there's been issues with crisis beds in places like that. Um, but can you explain a little bit more about the history of that? Because the crisis beds, crisis or beds. Because years ago, they used to institutionalize. Yes. People so, with so that's that's a great uh, thing. So the crisis bed has an alternative, is an alternative to uh, hospitalization. We now have, um, as you're aware of last year, we did a show on, you know, generally the uh, Washington County and the uh, Maple House um, crisis bed at uh, Washington County. Um, but that's a peer, that's a peer bed. But there are other types of crisis beds um, and there are alternatives to the, ho they, they serve as an alternative to hospitalization um, because nobody wants to really go into hospital. Uh, so maybe they go to a crisis bed uh, for a few days or in some cases um, a couple weeks. Um, Has it there. lasted longer than that, month? Yes, yes. There's been a few of, the, yeah, that's true. Actually, you're right, Larry. Um, there have been a few instances of a few months in a crisis bed, but um, again, the crisis bed serves as an alternative to an emergency room, and I would much prefer somebody who could be in a crisis bed, be in a crisis bed, than sitting up in the emergency room. So uh, a crisis bed, uh, so what is it? A place to sleep, a so, place to eat. That's so, well, that sounds all good, but that's the crisis bed is that, is that plus it provides supports um, like the Washington County program, the Home Intervention Program provides um, that support that you just mentioned, the eat and sleep thing, the TV thing, but it also provides. They're able to. They have nursing there. They have. Um, Can they help somebody? the person wants to find a job. Uh, it would be done through their service at the agency. So the case manager in the agency would help them with that. Mm -hmm. um, through through our, you know, an employee specialist, employment. No, I know Vermont, uh, from what I understand, um, I think it's through CVH. Um, Vermont, does it have a psychiatric center do you guys work closely with them? Uh, Vermont has a uh, yes. Uh, Vermont has a um, Vermont has the uh, psychiatric uh, hospital uh, next to CBH. Mm -hmm. Do you guys work closely uh, with them? Well, I think uh, we work closely if our people if our people go in there, and I also believe in our screening team, which is the emergency screening team provides screenings for folks who are going, who have to go in there. Because mm -hmm. that psychiatric hospital requirement is involuntary. So... What do you mean by, it, it, what's the difference between voluntary and... and oh, good question, Larry. Uh, so I can voluntarily admit myself to Central Vermont Hospital. Um, and involuntary would be if, um, 
if I was held against my will. Um, if because, I, because you're, you're um, harming yourself? You're yeah. harming myself or I'm a risk for others as well. What do you mean by risk for others? I mean a risk of uh, harming other people. Mm -hmm. So if I say I'm going to kill six people or if I'm going to go out and do something, then that's, you know. But the other, the other thing that tends to happen is the risk of harming myself. Okay, that'll, that'll, that could turn into an involuntary situation. Um, but I think our general, uh, you know, purpose is to keep it, if we can, voluntary. But not everybody wants to be held against their will and you'll be at a hospital. And so sometimes it has to go down that route. I, I certainly don't like that idea. The, um, in terms of crisis intervention, um, if someone has to go to a hospital, what did it like? Describe a, a 72, I, I'm sure Vermont has this uh, the 72 hour hold situation. Uh, Vermont has a, um, does have a 72 hour what, Can hold. you explain that what that is? Yes, I can, I can a little bit. Um, what happens is, and I don't have the material in front of me, but what happens is if I'm held, if I want to be held, uh, not want to be held, I mean, if someone wants to, if someone feels on a professional staff at the hospital, a doctor feels I'm at risk, of, or a screener feels I'm at risk of harming myself or others. What do they do? They, they do they, papers. No, but they take your belt away, they take your keys, yes. they take anything sharp away That's from right. you, yeah. your shoes. Yes. They, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, you could actually, they do, um, you know, paperwork, but there's a process. You have to be, you know, you have to have a screening done by the, by a designated agency who has the screeners. Washington County is one of them. And these are outside folks who come in and, um, you know, screen me to make sure that I need to be in the hospital. Maybe I don't. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, and then they do papers that are set. And another doctor, besides the doctor referring, um, has to also be part of that process. So there's a huge process to get, some, not huge, but it's, it's not just your relative can have you committed anymore. I remember, <laughs> I always had this thing, you know, Joe, so, you know, I used to do a training exercise um, called the Auntie Lulu exercise where we'd take Aunt, Lu Aunt Lulu to the hospital and drop her off. And that's just not how that happens anymore. There's a lot more uh, rights to it. And, you know, NAMI, who you just, you know, you just interviewed, NAMI, NAMI has a, you know, they do a lot of work in that area as well. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the history of, um, like, how people with mental illness or mental challenges were treated back then versus now. Uh, yeah. is, it, is it a better system now than it was? I think it is a better system now than it was. And How so? Because there's a lot more uh, people out in the uh, community able to do their uh, thing, contribute to society, work in society, and not be stuck in a 1,500-bed uh, hospital. Um, 1,500? That was at, uh, at its peak, around 1,500 at the State Hospital in Waterbury. Um, and it uh, closed um, due to the flood in Irene, uh, the, her, the tropical storm Irene. Um, and then they made it less beds? They, uh, they opened the, uh, well, they ended up opening a temporary uh, hospital in Morrisville, um, and then they opened the psychiatric center, in, uh, which they discontinued the hospital in Morrisville, and they opened the psychiatric center here in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that has 25 beds. And just before the state hospital closed in Waterbury, they had 54 beds. Um, but at its peak, Vermont State Hospital had 1,500 or so patients. And this was a while back. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, language, Mm -hmm. That was used around, uh, you know, mental illness or, or mental challenges. 
how how has language changed? You know, they don't use certain words that they uh, used to use. No, they or don't. Doctors don't. Use right, them. they don't. Um, they don't use those words uh, for the most part. Um, in fact, uh, Vermont state law um, laws were changed. The wording in the statutes in the books, law books, was changed as well. Um, a great example um, was they used to use the terminology of lunatic or crazy and crazy in the books. They did change that, um, so it's been changed. Um, and, and doctors, what I worry about with uh, doctors, net, what, with people now, particularly, you know, I come in the peer support world, is that we peers or peer support uh, folks uh, try to stay away from using clinical terms. So I really don't like the idea of trying to diagnose anybody. Um, I don't. We're just uh, as normal as everybody else. That's right. Yes. Yes. What, why, why, in terms of peer support, why are you, uh, are you training peer support people not to use certain language? Uh, because, it, well, it's, I'll tell you, it's uh, real easy to fall into the language because that's where most of us came from. You know where we would go to get our services, our case managers, and you know it's easy to say, um, yeah, he's got, he or she's got schizophrenia, or I think he's um, bipolar, needs to be on his meds. Um, that's, you know, that's not good for folks um, like us, um, like myself, who are trying to, um, you know do something a bit different than uh, I'm not a doctor mm -hmm. so and I'm not in the medical profession and I'm not required to follow professional you know I don't have to do those professional things I can be professional but that's something I've always kind of cringed at around you know when we talk about really quick here when we talk about the idea of you know funding sources including the idea of using um, Medicaid or dollars to do peer support. One of my concerns is that we would fall into a uh, category where we'd have to do uh, notes and lot, big note, you know, and and uh, case, write case notes. case notes. Yeah, and I do have. I will admit we do uh, notes, but now, but they're not these big notes that I'm I've seen in my office where you know. Where uh, in the crisis bed world, uh, we have to, we do have access to uh, notes. Um, For sometime. example, um, crisis uh, in, in situations. Mm -hmm. Are you under the state of Vermont known, or, or are you known as a mandated reporter? Yes, I am. Okay, can you explain in terms of crisis what exactly a mandated reporter does? Uh, Within the crisis world, uh, within the crisis world, well, a mandated report could be, um, you know, if I suspect or witness a situation that has to do with child abuse and neglect, mm -hmm. or in the adult world, somebody who has a friend has a so-called friend staying with them who is exploiting them through any means. And exploitation is, I'm borrowing your money all the time. I'm sucking your resources. Scams. Scams. Uh, well, it, scams, it, yeah. It big, but Larry, uh, you know, you call me up and you say, ah, I just gave $200 to my friend. He stayed with me. And then, oh, I have no food, though, now, Larry. And I'm um, really, he asked me for another $200, so I gave it to him. That's That could be heading for exploitation. Well, uh, there's scams now. Yeah. Someone claims to be from the Social Security Administration, right, or, or the IRS, or, right. You know. And, yeah. and now the other part of many reporting in a crisis is if the person tells me, and I've had to do this in the last year, but a person who tells me that they're going to go somewhere and do some harm to other people or themselves, and I have a reason to believe that they're actually going to carry it out. I'm required to report it, um, and you know I can report it uh, to the people who are going to be affected, or I can call law enforcement, or both, or both. And um, how does your agency? How does um, 
Washington County work with law enforcement when it comes to crisis? Well, they have a very, well, that's a great question, Larry, and they have a great uh, relationship with Washington County. Um, I think it's uh, much more improved uh, than uh, 20 or 30 years ago, um, but I think that uh, particularly our Montpelier Police Department, but other police departments also have a great working relationship. I've noticed that uh, Barry Police Department also has a great uh, working uh, relationship with them. But I, I think that uh, that's a good thing to have that ability. And not, but I'll tell you, uh, crisis and law enforcement. As far as if Joe Public is in crisis and a law a cop comes in. The, the issue with cops in crisis uh, with, uh, with Joe Public, uh, who is in crisis, it could exasperate Joe's uh, mental health right there. It could cause a bigger, it, you know, there's something about law enforcement. We all have been through this. I don't know if you have, but I, I've run into a couple issues with law enforcement myself, but I respect them. But when you're on the other end of that spectrum of the cop shows up at your house and wants to know about this or calls you up out of the blue and says, I need to, to just check something, and you, you go on guard. You know, somehow there's always this. And then there are people who have plainly told me, please do not call the cops. I'll do whatever you need me to do, but don't call the police. Mm -hmm. Others tell me they don't care, and the police come anyway. But you know, generally, I think. And well, you're, I, you're a caring person, and you have to help those that need help. Yes. Now, boundaries. Uh, yes. In a crisis. Yes. Um, how important is? Okay, a person says, "Oh, um, I'm having. Oh, I'm having a meltdown. I'm having this crisis. I'm having that crisis. How do you know when and if to step?" Back, we are the as the as boundaries are concerned when you're dealing with a crisis. I have actually had a situation. I hope that's not a bad question. No, it's there's never a bad question. Um, I when I worked on the um, pier line, um, I used to have a gentleman who called me. He was quite. You don't have to mention names. Nope, right? we don't do that. But I will. I'll just say this gentleman used to call me. He was upset because one of our workers told their story, which um, we don't mind him telling stories, but this was, in telling the story, it traumatized this gentleman a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what happened was he was quite, you know, uh, every call was, you know, um, about this. And at some point I had to kind of challenge him and say, is there somebody else you can talk to about this? Because there's not much I can do about it. I've listened to you. There's a point where you say, and it's very rare for me, but there's a point where I will say to the person, is there someone else you can talk to? Because I can't, you know, I cannot help you with this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been through this, and I don't say like that. I'm very polite. But I felt bad um, for this gentleman. Um, and then he had told me, you know, he hadn't seen a counselor in 18 years. Um, but out thereafter, he kind of stopped talking about it with me because I think he recognized that we'd reached our point. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can't help somebody, you either tell them to go to someone else or... I, will I never tell them. I suggest to them that they go somewhere else. I don't tell them to go, I suggest that they go away from our service. I just, what I say to them is, is there somebody you can talk to about this, maybe a counselor uh, or something, maybe somebody who can kind of help you work through that. I think there are limitations to what I can uh, do uh, in certain situations. Um, and then the same thing with a crisis situation. Um, my my goal in each crisis situation is to uh, either uh, facilitate it so the person feels safe enough to move to the next step to get the help that they need or desire, um, or um, you know make sure that everybody uh, feels as safe as we can. Um, and that might be include that I, I um, my goal is to de-escalate the crisis. Last question before sure. we end. De-escalization mm -hmm. of, I think I'm saying it right, 
to de-escalate a situation in a crisis. Define de-escalate and what does that mean? So uh, my, um, when I want to de-escalate, my, my goal is to... Um, You're stopping it? Or you well, getting the person to kind of, you know, come back center. So there are the, a lot of people I've dealt with uh, are angry about something. Uh, I'm talking softly and they're up here, Zach, I think this is, okay. And my goal is to say, okay, um, Joe, I need you to, you know, we need to look at this a little more or something. We're very, I'll give you, uh, sure. uh, I'll give you an example. And, and if we go a little bit over, it's fine. All right. right. Um, in New York, and we can show piece of this video to, uh, uh, in editing. In New York, somebody walked into a bagel shop. It was on the news. I want a cinnamon raisin bagel right now, you know, and everybody's looking at them, right? They're yelling at the top of their lungs, right? So in a situation like that, if someone is yelling at you, you can't help them by having them yell at you, is there a way to de-escalate a situation if, in public, for example, someone's yelling and screaming and they might have a challenge? How do you de-escalate a situation? Like yeah, it depends on how. It depends on the situation. Depends on the. Depends on if the person's willing to, um, you know, come down. It might be as simple as he, he you know, used to he wants something, so we say, okay, so how can we get that for you? or I cannot do that for you right now, but let's try this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's- And a, you're doing it in a nice very way. soft, very soft approach. I think one of my goals is to always try to stay calm. Well, I always joke about it, I say, well, one of us has to stay calm. <laughs> uh, you, you know, because the reality, you know, and I'm not, uh, there are times when I used to, you know, I, I think it's a, yeah, it's a challenging thing because you have someone yelling and, and then and then uh, and then say if some people think it's yelling at them so they get they Defensive. both get yelling and and my goal is to uh, get get that situation you know uh, under control under control but there may be a time also where I'm not able to do that and they don't care. They want their cinnamon bun or whatever that was that you mentioned and and they don't care about my attempts. And so then that's where I see law enforcement sometimes has to get involved or, you know, and that's a sad day when that has to happen because I really, you know, my go, I, um, I know we're about over time, but I used to deal with people, I've dealt with people who um, also what I called ranting, where they get angry and they say things mm -hmm. uh, in a public space. Um, and, and, um, my, my, I always hated the, I always used to think, well, if they just were allowed to rant and we left them alone, they're okay. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, occasionally, you know, they'd rant and the law enforcement would have to get involved. Um, because it got out of hand. Um, thank you for joining me on this edition. And of, thank of you. Able Bit on Air. Uh, for those that uh, want to know more about Washington County Services, where can they turn? Uh, they can turn to uh, Washington County uh, Mental Health. We have a website, uh, wcmhs.org. And uh, what is the emergency crisis number? The emergency crisis number is 229-0591. Can you repeat that one more time? 229-0591. Well, I would like to thank you for joining me on this edition of Able Dinner Air. Um, this puts an end to this edition of Able Dinner Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. Arlene is off today. Thank you to our sponsors. See you next time for another exciting, informative edition of Able Dinner Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Able to Learn Air is sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Able to Learn Air is sponsored in part by 
Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together.